Welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Bill Cardwell of CNC Custom Drums and Gladstone Drum Shells. Bill, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm uh, honored to get to be on your uh, podcast. It's uh, it's an honor to have you here. Um, this was actually a request from a uh, from a listener, so this is really cool um, that we get to do this. And and honestly, the show is typically like I think I told you before, it's about like Leedy in the twenties and all this stuff. And and you are a little bit of a newer company, but you were just telling me that it has a lot of vintage heritage. So I'm excited to learn about this. Um, why don't we go back to the beginning um, and just like I said to you before we did the interview, I don't know much about the history of CNC and Gladstone drum shell. So why don't you take it from the beginning and, uh, and teach us about basically your history and, and these and the two parts of your company. Let, let's do that. That would, uh, that would be very easy for me to do. I worked for a, then a $14 billion a year corporation uh, in the chemical industry. And uh, didn't like it a whole lot, but I, I would play the radio all the time, and I would listen to talk radio. Talk radio was big back in the and we we're talking early early nineteen eighties. Mm-hmm. And this guy, I was listening to this guy on the radio, and he was talking to a caller who wanted to do something to make some extra money. I was wanting to make some extra money because I wanted to buy a new PA system. For my band, back then when you had a band, you had to have your own PA system and and sound man and everything when you set up and played. So I was trying to make some, I wanted to make some extra money, sure. you know, because, you know, there were kids and everything else and life to take care of. So this guy goes, what do you love and what can you do? He, because this caller was fishing. Yeah. and so I got to thinking and I go, well, you love drums and you like fiddling with them. I'd always, I, my very first drum set when I was 15 was a gold sparkle Rogers drum set. And I was always messing with it. And, um, I'd had a Ludwig Acrolyte snare drum since I was 10. So I was always fiddling around with it. Anyway, I'd really, really loved, uh, I really loved tinkering with drums. That being said, I'm not what you would call a mechanical type person. Mm. I can't build a square box. <laughs> uh, it's total impossibility. Anyway, I started, I put an ad in uh, a little paper called the Thrifty Nickel, and it said, cash paid for used drums. And... It had my beeper number on it. This was the days of beepers. And I, Kansas City was rich with old drums. Just back in the 1920s and 30s, I mean, there were so many. Duke Ellington came out of here. And um, so, so, so Bird, Bird was from here. And, and it was just, it was just a hopping town when they talk about 12th street and vine that was where all the action was and uh, why we even have a line called 12th and vine Hmm. but um so i started just getting drums and fixing them up and selling them and getting drums and fixing them up and selling them and i was doing this out of my uh family room downstairs in the house and in the garage and before I knew it, I had like accumulated a double car garage worth of stacked up drums uh, from all eras. And I drove out probably about an hour from Kansas City, and this guy had a big old double bass pearl, inexpensive drum set with some cymbals and stuff. And he wanted $600. I go, man, you got anything else here? And he said, yeah, I got this old broken down drum in the closet. He went over to his closet and pulled it out. And it was the first time in the world I saw a super sensitive with the snare wires underneath the top head and underneath the bottom head of a Ludwig Black Beauty. Mm. 
And and I said, well, throw that old drum in. I'll give you 600 bucks. Wow. And so uh, I didn't have any idea what I was even looking at. And I um, went to a music store here in Kansas City. And the guy immediately offered me $600 for it. Well, 1980, somebody's offering you $600 for a broken down old drum. Something's not right. You know, didn't add up. Yeah. So I I, I passed on the deal and uh, started doing some research and found found a guy by the name of John Aldridge. Oh, yeah. And John Aldridge, I think, is the guy who did more for the inception or the uh, popularity of vintage drums. Uh, I started talking to him on the telephone, found out a lot of stuff from him, and uh, we kind of kind of went from there, so to speak. And then I had already had a lot of knowledge on shell construction and such from, you know, going and buying these old drums. I would go, I, I, I mean, I, I did silly stuff like went to a, went to a guy's trailer that was out in the middle of nowhere. And he wanted, tw- he saw my ad and he wanted 20, 20 bucks for this drum set. Well, it was 1952 Gretsch Green Sparkle 22-13-16 with a, a 60s Ludwig wooden snare drum on it uh, covered in aluminum foil, which I found out was mod orange when I got home. But, <laughs> you know, just crazy stuff like that. He won 20 bucks because he had mowed a woman's yard and she didn't have the money to pay. Wow. And now, so, um I mean, just crazy stuff like that was happening. And there was no such thing as vintage drums at that point in time. Modern Drummer came out, not in my world, and and there there was a small cluster of people across the country that it was like, it's some way we all seem to find each other, you know? And, 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 And mostly it was through John Aldridge. Uh, I know I got this call from John one day and it was this guy named Rob Cook and Rob called me and he said, John Aldridge told me to call you because you can answer the questions that I have about vintage drums. And so I go, okay, now that, like I said, this is even pre cell phone. He's calling my house phone. And so sitting there and I talked to him and I talked to him and I talked to him. And then I passed him on to, to uh, someone else with a good degree of knowledge. And I called John and John said, man, I can't, I can't be on the phone anymore talking vintage drums to, to any new people because my wife's going to divorce me because <laughs> I'm on the phone all the time. <laughs> so <laughs> we were, I mean, there, we were, we were sp- all spread across the country and, he had a newsletter that was a single page of uh, typed out, you know, hey, I've got this. Hey, I've got that. Hey, I've got this. I got I had the honor because I had a color printer a- in the office uh, that I worked out of at, at Bayer. Uh, I actually printed the very first color, not so modern drummer. That's so funny. John John has been on the show before and has told a little bit of the other side of this from his perspective. And I, I think he he actually mentioned you in that episode and talked about that. So it's it's funny to hear it uh, come from you as well. And he mentioned that his wife was like they were in marriage counseling because of this in the phone bill and the constant uh, discussion. So that's that's hysterical. Yeah. And he I mean, I, to me, he's like the godfather of vintage drums that people don't really know about or appreciate what what he did for it for them in the day and and a lot of it has comes out of this baby boomer generation that i'm a part of because these were the drums from that we saw when we were kids uh usually we couldn't couldn't a lot of us couldn't afford them and then grew up and I was probably somewhere around 29, 30 years old, 
maybe a little older than that, but you know, early thirties at that point in time. So we were, we were, you know, we had a desire then for the things of our youth that were, were gone. And I'd totally quit playing drums and uh, which was something else that seems to be a reoccurring theme among my generation. We went on, we got our company jobs, we did our thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, we'd been away from drums all for eight or nine years. And it's like, man, I want to play the drums again. So I'd gone out and bought a new Pearl drum set and it wasn't really, you know, it wasn't the sound that I wanted. Yeah. So you, so you end up, uh, you end up going through this process and over the years, vintage drums went from this neat little club to this huge, 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 huge amount of people. And the original C and C was a guy named David Carrington and Bill Cardwell. And David wanted to build drums. And uh, we ended up doing a retail store because he had so many vintage drums and I had so many vintage drums and they were overrunning houses or both of our houses. So we, we, we just got a storefront and, and started selling sticks and heads and used and vintage drums out of, a, out of the store. And um, he wanted to start building. He also started a family about that time. But the first drum set I got to build, I built out of, uh, with Keller shells, I built out of my, uh, my garage. Uh, I'd shipped uh, three pallets of drums to a gentleman called, named Paolo Sperlotti in Italy that Ludwig eventually did a book called the Paolo Sperlotti Collection. And all the drums in the book, except for Ian Pace's Made in Japan kit and Cozy, uh, Cozy Pal's Red Sparkle Ludwig kit. Um, all the other drums in that, that book came out of Kansas City, out of people's basements and garages and whatever from over the years. Hmm. So um, it just got to be something that, there were so many people involved. There was, it wasn't the cool little club anymore. Uh, I, I don't want to say I lost interest because I've never lost interest in, in old drums. It's just that I started wanting to, I started messing around with a router on a router table. And if an old vintage, a vintage drum had an extra hole in it back in, say 1990 1991 two three nobody even wanted it you couldn't give it away oh it's got an extra hole no they all they moved the realm out no i don't want it you know uh, none of those things were really they didn't retain their vintage value at that time because there was so much pristine stuff out there and you could buy it for nothing uh, so um i started messing with the shells that had been uh, bastardized, so to speak, to where I thought, okay, if I was building this drum and I wanted to get the sound out of it, so I just started messing with the bearing edges on vintage drums that I couldn't sell. In retrospect, I wish I'd have left the darn things alone, but it, <laughs> it, it, did, give me a, it did give me a lesson and how the edges were then, um, yeah. the shell constructions of all the different drums and and all of that. But Paolo, Paolo Sperlotti uh, did interviews and wrote for magazines. And he had Carl Palmer of Emerson, Lake and Palmer at his house. And he was doing an interview. And the, the, I don't know, I think it was like three pallets of vintage drums showed up while they're doing the interview and all of a sudden, you know, they're in there tearing boxes open and seeing what's come from the United States. And Carl said, I've always wanted a drum set in my sizes that looked like 
Gene Krupa's kit from the 1940s, but had gold hardware on it. Hmm. And Apollo said, call my friend Bill Cardwell. He'll make it for you. And wow. So I start getting these telephone calls and this guy in a British accent that was a little bit higher pitched than me, you know, saying, this is Carl Palmer. And I'm going, yeah, I'm Buddy Rich. You want to go to Pizza Hut and have pizza? You know, it's like, <laughs> I thought it was one of my friends just messing with me. And I did have a fax machine at home and that's the way Paulo and I communicated and finally, uh, I get a fax from him telling me, you stupid idiot, Carl Palmer's trying to call you. Will you talk to him when he calls and quit hanging up the phone? So the very first drum set that I got to build was, and I, and I used Keller shells, and I made it with a six-ply maple uh, with six-ply reinforcement rings. It was white marine pearl. I had a bunch of old Radio King hardware that was, because it, it wasn't being reproduced back in that time, mm -hmm. but I had a whole bunch of old Radio King hardware, and I went and had it gold-plated and basically built Carl a double bass drum set to his specifications, and... Um, that kind of opened the door for building drums. And my partner, David, he wanted, he was really into it. Well, he was also starting a family at that time too. And by the time we started building drums out of the back of our store in a little room that was about 12 feet long and six feet wide, um, he, he got busy with family and, he was he was an engineer and he ended up uh me buying him out and he mm. ended up moving to dallas and he and i are still great friends to this day i love That's the great. guy to death and uh so we don't have any of these it, it was it was not a bad thing but we were just we would just build a set in the back of our store and set it out on the floor but when I saw that the big boxes were all coming to town and everything, I got, I sold the stores, was offered early retirement from Bayer Chemical Corporation. And, uh, and, and it just seemed like everything was lining up to, uh, to start making drums. Now I had four artists at that time. I had a grand total of four endorsers which uh, wasn't much. Maybe no, by then I had, I had five. Hmm. Uh, I forgot. We get, we picked up Sparkle Horse, which <laughs> was a great pickup too. So we, we had, anyway, we had, we had five drummers and no potential for selling any more drums. Now, what year is this at this point? That by this time, we're looking at 2003. Oh, Okay. Uh, we're, we're, we're all the way up to April of 2003. And now let me ask you, was Carl Palmer's set, was that technically like the first CNC drum set? It was, it was, um, I didn't, there's, there's not any badges. Some, I, I got a, you know what? I got a picture of that drum set about three weeks ago. It's a first, I didn't even take a picture of it when I made it. Didn't, oh, wow. didn't think anything about it. And so I got a picture of it the other day, and I can't remember what I did for badges on it. I don't even think I did badges on it, or maybe, I don't know. Hmm. Can't remember. Cool. Can't even remember. But uh, it was. It was the first drum set I ever made. So Not bad. So, yeah, kind of. it's kind of tough when you start there, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but we would, I built a, I, we would build a kit and we would put it in our store. And we, we took one to the Chicago show uh, early on. I think it was the second or third Chicago vintage show. We took a custom, David and I took a custom built drum set. And I, and it, I remember it had a seven by 13 wooden snare drum on it and all Aldridge came, he kept coming over and playing that snare drum. And he goes, why does this sound like a metal snare drum? 
uh, and I'd say, John, because you, all you hear in your head are metal snare drums, so it's going to sound like a metal snare drum. <laughs> I don't, I didn't have any answer for yeah. him or anything, but so you know, it just what's the I guess it all organically occurred. Yeah, it sounds like it is, is the only way. There was no, as I look back on it, I should have had better plans, but I didn't have any plans. I just. I uh, just was kind of flying by the seat of my pants. Sure. And we had a major drum company at that point in time. <clears throat> excuse me, in 2000, they were interested in uh, what I was doing with building drums. And so I thought we were going to do something with them, but I'm not going to get into that. It, sure. It, it was, it, it didn't, it didn't pan out and I was kind of, forced into a situation of like, gee, well, now what are you going to do? And uh, we just kind of uh, made it along, you know, one day to the next. And, uh, I mean, I would literally build a drum set. My son was on tour, and he was on Lakeshore Records then and had to do a European tour. So we built a drum set, and... He took it to Europe. I said, "Leave it over there. Uh, we get any. We get any more artists. We're going to need. We're going to need backline drums for. You know, I'm already thinking about backline drums and don't even have orders. <laughs> and uh, and I said, we're going to need it for our artist one of these days. And he did. That's and great. it stayed out. And that kit stayed over there for years and years and years." But we reached the point where we couldn't make the shells. Uh, Keller makes great shells. I don't have anything against their work at all. In fact, after us making shells, I have more respect for what they what they have done over the years. But no one was making shells like they made them back in the 40s, 50s, 60s in early 70s and that was that was kind of my point of reference of of what i wanted to be able to produce as far as drum shells were concerned so it was imperative to get drum shell molds in here to uh to make drum shells to get those sounds and not to make replica drums Mm -hmm. but to make drums to the specifications of what those shell constructions were. Yeah. And when we did make them, then to, uh, um, and the, these machines are so much better than the equipment that they had to use back, back in the 1960s. So, you know, it's, it's not the same as, an, as a 1966 psychedelic red sparkle drum set that the edges have been all beat up on and still sounds great. Yeah. You know, it's built in honor, so to speak of those drums and hopefully they'll have the longevity that they're still around 50 years later and people want to play them too. You know? Yeah. And now, so this is Gladstone drum shells, correct? Which, um, right. which I think you were telling me before that, you did sell them as drum shells at one point, but then it got to be too crazy because I think we're getting there, but CNC has just blown up in popularity. And I, it sounds like that's right at about the time in that mid 2000s where we're at. But, um, and Gladstone yeah. is named after the town. Well, you- we're, yeah, we're in the town of Gladstone, Missouri. However, when I was 10 years old and my mom traded in her French horn, uh, that she had played in high school and got me a um, 1966 Acrolyte snare drum. And they just came out with a UF. Uh, they, I think they call them UFO cases now. Mm. But uh, that 66 uh, Acrolyte, and it had a practice pad on top of it that had Billy Gladstone's name on it because he had invented the Billy Gladstone had invented that practice pad. And so the patent to Ludwig. Oh, that's great. So I, I would have to practice of course with, with my practice pad on cause no one wanted to have, have to listen to the snare drum and 
me trying to learn to play it. So there was that correlation. And then my store was in Kansas City, but if you drove six blocks down the same street, all of a sudden you were in this small township of Gladstone. Mm. And uh, I found an industrial building, and uh, it was just pretty much an empty concrete floor and space. And we built the we built a, a drum building facility that based off of how we build drums. I mean, we've just kind of winged it. We've winged everything <laughs> along the way. <laughs> well, it's you know, worked. We, yeah. And uh, I mean, we've never really advertised. Uh, we, we, you know, we ask our artists to keep the C's on the bass drum head. That was one thing that we wanted. They, they, I've, I, I've learned to tolerate and be okay with the fact that the C's aren't always on the head. That's my 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 problem because you know they do change bass drum heads. And sure, some artists don't want branding on their stages and all these different things. So I've had to grow out of that to speak. But it, literally, this company has grown on the back of our artists. They have been responsible for what we've done over time. And a lot of the ideas that have occurred have occurred because of artists. Yeah. Now, uh, like that, the player date line, we knew we wanted to do it. And we didn't know exactly how we wanted to do it. But we had two artists who had asked for a center lug kit, you know, and and one of them was made with a maple shell. I mean, both of them were made with maple shells. And then I got a call when we had we started we had started working with a gentleman named Joey Wanaker. And Joey called me one day and said, "Hey, I uh, I picked up this old Majestic kit, and it just sounds so great. Can you make me a set of shells like these old Majestic shells?" and um which were were luan shells and so we went about you know finding the right wood to to make those shells and when we made them they were so musical and so nice you know coming out of modern day machines and not being made you know like like they had to be made back in the 60s and yeah. and early 70s when they were being made. I mean the technology helped that helped that shell too and it just you know tonally it was just it was just great and Jake and I worked the better now now we're all the way up to 2011. Jake and I worked just about all that year on uh, coming up with that player date one kit. And so when we built that thing and we managed to get it out to the NAM show and we built a few other, a few other shells, but I got, when we got on the plane and we were flying out to the NAM show that year, I said, you know, and we, I think we were offering them in three colors. And I said, you know, if I can sell 25 of these, because I'd quit going to NAM shows because we were a custom company. Yeah. We would, we would, we would build everything, fill up a booth. We'd sell everything in the booth and we wouldn't take any drum orders. So basically it was, you know, I don't know. It was it it didn't i didn't need my ego stroked i was past that by that time but the uh the player date ended up being a drum set that we we ripped off the 60s scratch edge on the shells which was you know one of the things that jake jake's id said hey let's try these these full contact edges mm. and so we did that and and he took them out and played them on a few gigs and stuff and yeah. And we messed around with that. So Jake's always Jake's always been a guy who's who had the ideas and I had ideas and we'd put them together and when they would mesh and they would make sense. 
you know, we would usually have something that was doable, so to speak. That's so cool. And that's so, Jake Cardwell, who's your son, obviously, too. Right, right. Yeah, that's great. So, um, so I went out there, and I think we sold like 60-something player. It took orders for like 60-something player date kits. But wow. when, I was, when I was on the plane on the way out there, I said, if I can sell 25 of these, I'm going to when I get back to Kansas City, I want to try maple on the outside and maple on the inside and and leave that luon in the middle and see if I can come up with a drum shell that's going to be different in sound but still going to have that more of that vintage sound to it and uh give me another line of these. Well, when we so the 67 we had to focus on building those yeah. and getting those to stores and hoping they sold because it's one thing to take the orders and sell one order of them you know out the door it's another thing then to get reorders yeah. so um as soon as we got them out the door i said hey guys i notified the store owners we got a new drum shell it's called a player date too and uh I didn't even tell the I didn't even tell the guys when I thought when I thought of the maple I didn't even tell them till we got back to Kansas City, so they didn't tell anybody else because I don't think maybe there was you know I don't think in 2011 or January 2012 anybody was doing anything with a full contact edge at that point. Really? Well, no. I mean, it was not. I don't. You know. I may be wrong, but I don't know anybody who was doing it. Um, well, I think everything was much sharper. The bearing edges were a lot sharper at that point. Oh yeah, they were, and and which I like too because it sure. gives you a real wide range too. But anyway, but I I no more got back, and some uh, uh, another little drum company had had a already had a a video on on line from a store in um uh, in um the uk where this guy says me and so and so put our heads together and we came up with this great new edge and it was like he just that ain't a new edge that's the 60s scratch edge and you just saw it in my booth at the nam show two weeks ago so i just quit to go in the nam show that in was like yeah, I'm not going. I'm not going out there. I'll just people can just find out what we're doing when we're doing it. <laughs> yeah, that's so, a common theme nowadays. Yeah, so I just don't, you know, you just so I gave up on that. But um, anyway, we've uh, we do things that we do because I like those shells that he was that Joey was talking about, and Joey has a phenomenal ear. And I've had artists along the way who we've listened to. And if you listen to these guys and the sounds they want and are able to reproduce the sounds that they want, then, um, then it's, then it's a value. Then yeah. It's, then it's worthwhile. Yeah. It's, um, I'm a big fan of the old MIJ, the stencil kits as well. Like the majestic, they, um, I just think for the value you get, you know, you can get a nice, cool, vintage drum set with amazing finishes and uh, and they sound great. And the snares especially are amazing. So it's cool to know that that's kind of a part of your history as well a little bit. Right. Well, and everything back then was, I mean, through the 90s, we were educated on more resonance, more resonance, more resonance, more resonance. And everybody was trying to build a drum that would just resonate all over the place and going thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner on the shells. It ended up that there was a great number of people who wanted drums that didn't ring on forever. I love a a big full sound. Yeah. Uh, But, you know. My son just as soon throw a tea towel over a floor, Tom, and play it as, as not. Exactly. And everyone's using moon gel now, and it has been for a long time, but you, you get the drums that resonate forever, but then you dampen them to get like that nice kind yeah. of studio, you know, studio ring sound. And uh, so yeah. it's kind of redundant. 
Yeah, and it, well, it's like the the second drum set that we built for Ringo. We built Ringo a drum set, and then cool. he he didn't uh, he wasn't he wasn't big on uh, drum construction. I mean, you know, wasn't aware on drum construction. But why would he need to be? You know? Yeah. He could play it. He could take a brand new pair of Zildjian hi hats and make them sound just like when he's sitting there playing, you know, in the 60s. I'm standing inside of the stage. He's doing sound check. He's sitting there and I'm going, how does he get the same sound he got out of those mm. old K symbols? Does he get out of that? these brand new hi hats? Yeah. He's getting the same. It's him. Yeah, it's him. But his drum tech is J- Jeff Jonas is. <laughs> Very, very knowledgeable about drum shell construction and such. Extremely knowledgeable. We built him a drum set, and and he liked the he liked the drums quite. He liked the set that was built, but he got the impression from Jeff that I could make a drum set sound like whatever he wanted it to, because Jeff taught him about bearing edges and why his drum set sounded the way it did was another on drummer on tour who had flown down the front of house man from the guy that she had played with at the show that I went to in Chicago to find out why Ringo's drums sounded better than the drums that uh, hmm. she was playing at that time. And well. of course I told, I told him it's cause you're playing them and which <laughs> he said, that's right. <laughs> Which he, was, he was right. <laughs> Man, you know, I just had uh, Gary Astridge on the show. I actually did the interview with him. Oh, Gary, on, I, man, I haven't seen Gary in 20 years, I bet. That's funny. I talked to him uh, on Friday, two days ago. This is Sunday today. And um, he talked about that, about how Ringo, just anyone else could play it. And then Ringo picks it up and it sounds like Ringo. Like it sounds, yeah. there's there's no denying that. Yeah, yeah. It's and 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 that's what it was. But he decided he wanted a drum set that sounded like when you played the Let It Be album. Hmm. Now he didn't want it to sound like the drums on the that that when he live hit the drums on the Let It Be album, he wanted a drum set that sounded like when you played the record, he wanted the drums to sound like the record. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, which, uh, you know, it's like, whose stereo are we play in this on? My <laughs> stereo, your stereo. Exactly. They're lot, probably not the same. A lot but, of variables. Uh, yeah, a lot of variables. So, um, but we, you know, and it ended up is like, hey, did you use that natural maple kit that um, used on the rooftop and a video? Yeah, yeah. I go look at the rooftop. He's got a towel over the floor, Tom, you know, <laughs> so yeah. what, what the edges I ended up cutting on that, uh, maple poplar maple kit ended up being what we, the edges we use now on our 12th and vine kit. Hmm. So he, he helped me out with those edges wow. because that's, that's the, that's how I cut it. Uh, and so I figured. Well, heck, it's good enough for him. It ought to be good enough for the rest of these guys too. So yeah, really. And I mean, it's not like like I said before. You were getting to the point where, I mean, you must be just thrilled that C and C has become one of the most popular, you know, kind of boutique drum brands uh, in the world. I mean, you guys have just a very like. There's no other brand really like it. I mean, you're it. it they feel vintage, but they're just the quality is just beyond apparent when you see them and when you play them so um i mean things just skyrocketed for you guys yeah i mean how do you how do you know you don't know yeah i mean, I mean you, you 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 just have no idea and 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 the, i mean but there's like i said it it's it comes all from the comes from the artist i mean the artists are the guys that have uh, I haven't made CNC what it what it is as far as drums are concerned. The artists have, and and you know, my de- maybe my desire to facilitate what they're asking for. But uh, a lot of these guys have just had the idea, you know, 
and and we've got to do some cool cool things you know that i never thought i'd get to do i mean i well i look i grew up in rural arkansas on a gravel road and worked in a cotton field when <laughs> i was a kid that's my life Man. you know so the life that i came out of uh so it was like what's the chances of a guy uh in arkansas uh who was seven years old when the beatles were on ed sullivan ever getting to build one drum set for ringo much less two you know yeah. that doesn't happen no. so it's just there's been a lot of good dumb luck is all i can say yeah you've you've made it and and uh as we get close to the end here, why don't you tell people, is there anything kind of cool you guys are working on now? I mean, uh, it's it's 2020 right now. Um, anything cool in the works? Are you guys kind of just business as usual? Um, we're working on some metal shells cool. that are un- unique and different that have a lot to do with copper. And... I love the sound of copper and the effect that it has. So I, I've built several of those. I think Memphis Drum Shop has some, and a few other stores have uh, some of those snare drums. And uh, both the guys in Modest Mouse have them. And and uh, and uh, I sent one to New York for Joey uh, Wanaker to use on a. Uh, a gig he had to do in New York with Paul Simon or something. I can't. Remember. Anyway, <laughs> and he said, "Can I keep this?" And I'm like, "Yeah, keep it. You know, why not?" Wow. So, uh, so we're those are something that we're we're playing with a lot right now. I think we're going to take the player date line a little bit uh, uh, expanded and offer some new things with it. I don't know. We just kind of like, we still fly by the seat of our pants yeah. so to speak, around here. It's, uh, it's just the way, it's just the way things seem to go. Well, it's working. Um, you've come a long way from the, uh, you know, the fields of Arkansas to be, to be doing this now and brushing with the, the greatest drummers in the world. That's just really cool. It's kind of an inspirational story and it sounds like passion is kind of at the heart of all of it of just uh and I, I like how you said too where like you were out of it i mean you had a full-time regular job you were out of it for a little bit and then you you came back and and look at you now so you know everyone gets that where they get you know a little burnt out on practicing or life takes over and um oh yeah i was four, i was 47 years old when cnc custom drums became an entity unto itself wow so i didn't you know, I thought at that point in time, there weren't very many custom drum builders. I, I, by golly, I think within a year after I opened up CNC Custom Drum, there's many uh, drum builders as there were convenience stores. Every Everybody who couldn't yeah. get a job ended up being a custom drum builder, I think. For, yeah. So there's, you know, so it's like, uh, I don't know. They, there's a lot out there, and there's a lot, there, and there's people out there doing great work too. So, well, I think we live in a special time of uh, of drum building, and and again, our community is really strong, and um, and I think uh, everyone has a lot of respect for what you're doing, just because you guys keep your head down and do your work and uh, and produce great drums. So, um, I think now is a great time to tell people that they can check out CNC Drums at C and c drums usa.com so that's c a n d c drums usa.com and um i really want to give a quick shout out to uh jonathan webster who is the gentleman who reached out to me and requested this episode oh yeah from cool. canada yeah so that's that's pretty cool um uh, yeah. why are canadians such cool people <laughs> i am just the, are I, we they 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 just they are just I've, I've we've had so many great Canadians that uh, play our drums that have just been sweethearts. Yeah, great people, the neighbors to the north. So uh, thanks, Jonathan, and uh, and to anyone else out there Absolutely. who wants to to reach out and request some episodes. That's uh, always welcome. So um, 
Bill. And let's give a let's give a shout out to your son Jake as well for helping you kind of get he 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 was pivotal in us getting connected and helped you with the setup of the computer and all that. So thank you to Jake as well. Absolutely. Great. And well, thank this, you. Yeah, this has been an absolute pleasure to uh, to talk to you and uh, keep up the good work and uh, we'll be in touch down the road. All right. Great. Thanks, Bill. Take care. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>